Hi, everyone. We apologize for the delay in getting started, but we want to thank you all for joining us today for Constangi's webinar, Protected Concerted Activity and the NLRA. A couple of housekeeping items before we get started. If you have questions throughout the presentation, please submit them through the chat function. You can access the chat through the toolbar located at the bottom of your screen. Our presenter will leave time to answer your questions. This program is approved for Sherman HRCI credit. We will be sharing those codes at the end of this presentation, so please stick around in order to get the codes. Lastly, we will be providing a copy of the PowerPoint used during today's webinar and a recording of the presentation. These materials will be sent to you once the recording has been uploaded by Monday morning. I'm now going to turn it over to today's presenter, Jonathan. All right, Jennifer, thank you very much. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Perfect. All right. Well, good afternoon, everybody. Thank you so much for being patient with us. Um, there's a very good reason that I don't work in Constangi's IT department, um, as we can see, but I think we're up and running now. For those of you who I don't know, let me introduce myself. I'm Jonathan Martin. Um, I am the office head of the Macon, Georgia office. For a number of years, I served as the co-chair of our traditional labor practice group nationwide. Um, I've been a traditional labor lawyer in one form or another for almost 30 years. I did not plan on being a management side labor lawyer when I was a child. I don't know that any child plans on that sort of thing. Um, my original plan, I grew up in Augusta, Georgia. Um, I wanted to go up to Hollywood uh, and be a stuntman. However, um, I quickly realized that that was not my destiny. So when college appeared to be my destiny, my father, uh, who was a retired army officer, was uh, keen for me to go to West Point. I had some maturity issues um, when I was 18 years old and realized West Point would not be a good fit. So the compromise we struck is that I would go to the University of Georgia and enroll in ROTC. Um, they were kind enough to help with my education. I became an Air Force officer. I received a delay to go to law school. After law school and became a member of the Georgia Bar, the Air Force pulled me on active duty and they invited me to fill out a document with that we affectionately call the dream sheet. Where do you want to go in the world? Of course, I put Hawaii and Germany and Italy and Spain and England and Southern California and Washington DC and the Florida Panhandle. And I wound up at Robbins Air Force Base, Georgia, 17 miles south of where I was standing when I opened up that envelope. And that is how I happened to the world of labor and employment law. Robbins Air Force Base is the largest industrial employer in the state of Georgia. They've got 30,000 manufacturing employees, all represented by the American Federation of Government Workers. Um, that is a labor union. And the, uh, the two labor lawyers that worked could not keep up with all of the issues. And although my primary job was being a court martial prosecutor, the colonel came to me and said, Martin, I said, sir, he said, what do you know about labor law? I said, not a darn thing, sir. He said, great, you're part of the team. And I quickly realized how difficult it could be to manage in a unionized facility. So with that, um, I learned a little bit about labor and employment law. And one of our senior reservists was then a Constangi partner um, who uh, invited me to join this law firm in 1997. And I've been doing it ever since. So let's talk a little bit about the National Labor Relations Act. It is the granddaddy of all labor and employment laws. Can you see the uh, screen, Jennifer? It's not in front of me. Yes, yes, we okay, can see perfect. it. All right, so let's talk a little bit about the National Labor Relations Act and how it came to pass. When we went from being an, a, a, an agricultural society in the United States to an industrial society in the late 19th century, we had a number of people who worked in factories and those factories were dirty and unsafe. They worked long hours in incredibly unsafe conditions for a pittance of a wage and what little wages they earned went right back into the mill owner's pocket in the form of overpriced substandard housing as well as overpriced substandard goods in the mill store. So about the beginning of the 20th century, many of you remember from high school civics, we decided that it would be a good idea, uh, or some of those folks decided it would be a good idea to band together and challenge the mill owner. The problem was, of course, the balance of power. The mill owner was friends with the sheriff and the judge. And you may remember from high school history, 
around the turn of the 20th century, we had deadly and bloody labor riots in the United States. Of course, we get into World War I, then we have the Roaring Twenties, then we have the Great Depression, and as part of the New Deal legislation, they passed a law called the Wagner Act. The Wagner Act created rights for labor unions, it created rights for workers, and it created a new government agency known as the National Labor Relations Board. All right, so the National Labor Relations Act, which is the Wagner Act and its 1947 Taft-Hartley amendments, which created rights for investors as well as owners and managers, uh, is the primary law that deals with union organizing in the United States. It, it, it applies to virtually all private sector employers in the country. Uh, let me see if I can move the screen. Pardon me. All right. It applies to virtually all private employers in the United States of America, whether you unionized or not. Section 7 of the National Labor Relations Act says that employees have the right to engage in protected, concerted activity for their mutual aid and protection. What does that mean? Protected. They get to complain about their working conditions. Concerted. It, it, it means that there is more than one that is complaining. And so, um, you know, it applies in a non-union setting, just, just like it gives uh, workers the right to join the Teamsters. The National Labor Relations Act is enforced by the National Labor Relations Board. That's a political body of five members that is appointed by the President of the United States. They serve in staggered terms, and so during a presidential term, the President has the ability to reappoint the board. The NLRB changes the law. How did they do that? Through two different ways. Number one is formal rulemaking. Of course, all of you recognize Congress, they are idea people. Thou shalt, thou shalt not. Once a law is passed, um, they generally give some administrative agency the ability to uh, complete the law by making re regulations. Now, the way that they can do it that has the most effect is through formal rulemaking through the Administrative Procedures Act. In addition, the National Labor Relations Board, they decide cases in three judge panels. Um, the National Labor Relations Board is divided into regions. They investigate unfair labor practice charges. The general counsel, the head prosecutor for the NLRB, litigates the case before an administrative law judge and appeals go to the full National Labor Relations Board in Washington, D.C., who act as an appellate court. President Biden is admittedly the most pro-labor president in modern history. In fact, many of you saw just a uh, week before last, he was actually on the picket line with the United Auto Workers, you know, which is something that is almost unprecedented for a sitting modern American president. One of his first acts, in addition to firing the general counsel and appointing a new head prosecutor, was... He started a task force on worker organizing and empowerment. What does that do? Well, that particular gov government body is a whole of government approach that was chaired by the then new Secretary of Labor, Marty Walsh, who was the mayor of Boston, and prior to that, a union organizer. And it had all the cabinet positions. And unlike prior administrations, that at least told us that the purpose of the government was to give employees free choice. The current administration believes that the power and the, the role of government is to increase union density. And so they've undertaken a number of things. Number one, leading by example. Number two, combining government agencies. Number three, increasing worker power in underserved communities. And the final goal is increasing union membership. You know, after the Taft-Hartley amendments, when the Na National Labor Relations Act was complete, one out of every three workers in the United States in the private sector was represented by organized labor. As of this year, the Bureau of Labor Statistics releases its union statistics every January. In January of 2023, 
it was 6% of the private workforce in the United States, down from 6.2 uh, the year before. And so there's been a steady decline. Let's face it, organized labor is big business. It is not a charity organization. Many of the labor unions have billion dollar annual budgets and they're threatened when their membership declines. The UAW is a prime example. Back in 1978, the UAW had 1.5 million dues paying members in the United States. As of this year, I believe it's 396,000, a membership loss of more than a million. So if they can't organize by convincing workers that a union's a great idea in a contested election, then the next best option is to change the rules and hamstring what management can do. And it's done so through the National Labor Relations Board, right? The National Labor Relations Board is probably the most political and least known of all government agencies. Members identify by political ideology. So, for example, Marvin Kaplan is the lone Republican. He's a management side labor law lawyer like myself who has spent a career representing companies. There's a vacant Republican seat. The remaining folks they are all identified and identify as Democrats. David Prouty, for example, was the general counsel of the Service Employees International Union in New York before he was appointed um, by the board. Um, Gwen Wilcox was recently uh, reappointed and she has spent her entire um, career um, the, uh, as a union side labor lawyer. I know member Wilcox, she and I work on a book called The Developing Labor Law. Um, a very, very smart person, a very, very nice person, but she and I don't see the world from the same perspective. Lauren McFerrin is the current chair and she is the one who sets policy and appoints panels. The head prosecutor is Jennifer Abruzzo. Jennifer Abruzzo spent her entire career um, advocating for workers at the National Labor Relations Board before she retired and then she was the general counsel uh, for the communication workers of America prior to being appointed as the general counsel. She is so far the most radical of all the GCs. All right, what is, what is their agenda? First of all, to expand protected concerted activity. This is a trend that started during the Obama administration. They started targeting non-union employers. I, I've noticed that in my own practice. Within the last four days, I have received two um, requests to re represent a company when they received uh, unfair labor practice charges. The unfair labor practice charges dealt with workplace policies, and neither of the companies is unionized. Neither of the companies is undergoing a labor campaign at this point. It's just workers are becoming smarter and smarter and they are understanding what their rights are. And in this case, we have the National Labor Relations Board who is attempting to invalidate policies in both cases. Um, in one case, it may be easy because it is just a policy that we have to discuss. The other case, the policy was enforced and an employee was terminated. Um, and we may be looking at consequential damages, which we'll discuss in a minute. All right, in addition, more and more, the NLRB is helping with organizing assistance. How are they doing that? By changing the rules, by changing the law, and by shortening the timetable. For those of you who aren't familiar with how a union is voted in, it's fairly simple. Under the statute, workers, 30% of a proposed bargaining unit needs to sign a union authorization card. Most unions will not file a petition unless they have at least 60%. The way the unions go about organizing is by using a thing called the Blitz campaign. What's the Blitz campaign? It was pioneered by the United Food and Commercial Workers back in the 1970s. And the idea is to keep the campaign underground. So the key is to have one internal organizer, that's one of your employees, for every 10 to 20 employees. There's a certain advantage to labor unions in, in, in using that methodology. Advantage number one, free labor. It doesn't cost them anything, so it's budget neutral. More importantly, coworker to coworker, right, has peer-to-peer -peer credibility. Um, 
juries see trial lawyers for what we are. We are paid salespeople who were selling them on, a, on an idea. The other guy is wrong and my guy is right. Um, same thing. Most employees see union organizers for what they are. Paid salespeople who are trying to convince them to sign cards. Think about it from this perspective. If you get a call from a telemarketer, how many of you immediately say, thank you for calling, let me go get my credit card? Probably not many. Your best friend from high school calls and says, I got the best deal on a toaster or an oven or a car or a TV. What's your inclination? Tell me all about it. Maybe I want to do that too. And so the idea is to keep the whole thing underground. Union cards are good for a year. And so unions have up to a year to attempt to organize your folks. The idea is to keep it all underground. And then right before they demand recognition from the company, that's when it is first announced to management. All right. Against that background, very few unions will file a petition for union organizing until they have at least 60%. There are two reasons for that. Reason number one, if they can't win an election unopposed, they certainly can't win an election when the workers hear the rest of the story. More importantly, if they can assert an unfair labor practice that is significant enough, they can ask the government for a bargaining order. Section 10J of the National Labor Relations Act says that the government can seek a, um, an injunction forcing an employer to recognize a union that lost election, an election if the unfair labor practice, practices committed by that employer were significant enough. What's the sort of the classic example of 10J conduct? The president of a privately held company standing up and saying, if you vote this in, I'll shut the place down. I have plenty of money to live for the rest of my life. I don't need this headache. All right. Under those circumstances, a rerun election won't unring that bell. So they look at the best evidence of voter intent prior to the unfair labor practice, which was a majority of the people signed the cards before that unlawful lawful threat. And in addition to that, the agenda is to increase bargaining power for unions. So how have they done that? Well, a number of things, and I'll cover this in a little bit more detail. Number one, they're taking a good hard look at handbooks. There was a recent case, the Stericycle case, that addresses and changes the standard for evaluating company handbooks. We'll talk about that in a second. A strict limit on confidentiality clauses. There was a, comp uh, there was a, a decision called McLaren McCombs, which says that a confidentiality clause in a separation agreement is unlawful because it violates employees section seven rights. In that case, there was a layoff. There was a severance package. The severance package had a confidentiality clause. And the board said that for you know, non-supervisory employees, those covered by the act, that protected concerted activity includes the ability to complain about the manner in which the severance came about, um, the way they were treated, and so a confidentiality clause is unlawful. All right, more and more, they are broadening what is protected concerted activity. I mentioned earlier compensatory damages. Um, last year, General Counsel Abruzzo mentioned that in one of uh, her writings. I happen to be on the West Coast where the folks who work on the Developing Labor Law book all get together once a year to talk about the book and what needs to be edited and changes in the law and the like. You know, it's a whole room full of management side labor lawyers, union side labor lawyers, the senior leaders from the NLRB, the board members, the general counsel. And, you know, most of the three or four days um, are a Huntley Brinkley type debate between a management side lawyer and a union side lawyer on either cases or board um, proposals. You know, is it good? Is it bad? Why is it good? Why is it bad? And the like. And then, of course, the board addresses everybody 
senior leaders from various divisions address folks and the general counsel addresses folks. And general counsel Bruzo took questions. One of the management side labor lawyers said, you know, general counsel, can you give us an example of what you mean um, by a compensatory um, or consequential damage? And here's the example she gave. An employee is fired in violation of their Section 7 rights. The employee, as a result of being fired, loses his health insurance. The employee can't afford to continue health insurance under COBRA. The employee is involved in a catastrophic car accident. The employee incurs hundreds of thousands of dollars in medical bills as a result of not having insurance. It was the general counsel's opinion that not only is the employer um, liable for reinstatement and back pay for a violation of that employee's Section 7 rights, but the employer would also be responsible for paying off all of those hospital bills um, that would not have been attributed to the worker but for the unlawful activity. So that's sort of what they're looking at. We're going back to Weingarten for non-union employers. Uh, we'll talk about that in a second. Um, we're going back to uh, a case called Banner Estrella, which said you cannot mandate confidentiality in investigations like sexual harassment. They're looking at addressing uh, strike replacements. Many of you know, an employee who goes on a strike, an economic strike, cannot be terminated for that conduct. That conduct is protected. But what you can do is you can permanently replace those workers. Um, the general counsel has issue with that. And then they are looking at expanding unionization through changing the law. Let's talk about Stericycle. So in that case, it overruled the Boeing decision, which was a Trump board decision. Labor lawyers refer to the board by the president who appointed them. And the Trump board, as one would imagine, was fairly moderate and leaning pro-company. And the Boeing decision basically said this. Every handbook rule falls into one of three categories. Patently lawful. Here are our hours of work, right? That doesn't infringe Section 7 rights. Patently unlawful. You can't talk about your wages. That is an unlawful policy. Workers that are not supervisors um, have a right under federal law to talk about their wages and speculate on yours. And that's patently unlawful. Even the pro-company types like myself say, yeah, that violates the law. And then there were the policies in the middle. And the Boeing case had a balancing test. It balanced the need of management to run the business with the Section 7 rights of the workers. Well, Stericycle reversed that. And here's the new test. Step one. If an employee could reasonably construe the policy as infringing upon their rights, then step two, the employer needs to be able to demonstrate that they could not do so with a more narrowly tailored rule, right? So in other words, it's not really a balancing test. It's if a reasonable employee would think it would infringe upon their rights, right? For example, um, rules that deal with civility, right? You can't be ugly and hostile to folks. Well, it turns out in a union campaign, there's a lot of that going on. Um, then we need to A, establish there's a legitimate purpose and B, there's not a more narrowly tailored approach. McLaren, we mentioned that. That was the case where there was a reduction in force and the employees offered a severance package. Of course, I imagine all of you on this call when you have a severance package, it has three things, right? Generally, in a, in a, a release of all claims, an agreement not to seek reemployment, and frequently a non-disparagement clause and a confidentiality clause. Ultimately, in McLaren McComb, they said, when it comes to non-supervisory employees, because the act doesn't apply to supervisors, they're excluded. Now, that begs the question, all right, well, Jonathan, who is a supervisor? Section 211 of the law defines supervisors as those who have the authority to hire, fire, discipline, direct, assign, and other things along those lines. All right, so if we're dealing with regular workers who are not supervisors, 
you can't mandate confidentiality. General Counsel Bruzzo did say that you can keep the financial terms confidential, but otherwise, everything else is fair game. All right, there's a new case. And this case, um, Juvely Aesthetics. On September the 1st, 2023, the regional director for Region 9, Cincinnati, sent a case up. In that case, it dealt with um, it, it dealt with covered employees, right? Those who are not supervisors. And um, it also um, dealt with um, you know, the, uh, the undermining of rights. And so that case really dealt with uh, whether or not you could enforce a non-compete. All right. Here's the game changer. CMEX construction. So, you know, real, I guess lesson and takeaway number one. Takeaway number one is that uh, be very, very careful of confidentiality agreements um, when it comes to non-supervisory, non-management workers. Lesson number two, be very careful about non-competes because the board is targeting non-competes. Of course, we've already had one government agency, um, the FTC, that has taken issue with non-competes. Now in Georgia, when we amended our constitution, you know, we broadened non-compete enforceability, but we limited to who it applied to. But here's the game changer. CMEX construction reaches back to a case from 1949 no, known as Joy Silk Mills. I told you earlier how unions work, right? They have a year to work, up, to work on your employees. For the longest time, we had about six weeks to tell the rest of the story. They must have 30% of your workers sign up uh, in order to have a, an appropriate showing of interest, but they won't generally file a petition unless they've got 60%. CMEX basically says this, that if you receive a demand for recognition um, where the union says, we have a majority of your workers signed up, then you have a very limited time frame to petition the board for a secret ballot election. If you fail to meet the standard and fail to meet the deadlines, you have forfeited your right. Now, why is that significant? Here's why it's significant. Here's how they get to your, your 60%. There was a Greek philosopher, Pareto, right? He came up with the 2080 rule. 20% 20 of your people are causing 80% of your headaches. 20% of your people are causing, you know, are doing 80% of your heavy lifting. The 20% that are causing headaches will sign right off the bat. Then you have others like in the South who aren't familiar and they'll sign up, hey, more money or do I sign? Then they begin to pressure people. I had a union election back in June and one of the workers came forward. She uh, told her manager, I didn't want to sign a union card, but it was 11 o'clock at night and I had two guys that came to my front door and put a card in my face. You know, she was about five, three and, you know, a hundred pounds soaking wet. And she said, these two big guys came to my door, um, right, about bedtime and said, either you're with us and you're going to sign this card or you're against us and we'll remember you. And so a lot of cards are signed through coercion, which is why over the years, unions lose about 50 percent of elections when there's a secret ballot involved. But CMAX says if you don't petition the government within 14 days, you lose that right to have a secret ballot election. All right, here's the key. You really need to train your supervisors to spot signs of, of union organizing. I have a case right now where we spotted it. I don't think they got to 50% because you know some of the pro-union folks were telling members of management they had 70% sign up. There was a card signing speech and most of the time when people hear what unions are really about and what's really involved in collective bargaining and what's really at stake, most employees will come to the conclusion, whatever problems we have here, this isn't our solution. So the key is this, we need to catch it early. That way you don't have to worry about the implications of CMEX. Because even if you meet the 14 day time window, the NLRB can basically force you to recognize the union if there are any, any unfair labor practices that are committed during that time period.
Speaking of units, when I first started this 30 years ago, there was generally a wall-to-wall -wall unit. In other words, all the people that worked in your factory, right? Excluding, um, you know, um, supervisors and other folks. Well, the case came up a couple of years ago called specialty healthcare. And what it basically said is that unions can cherry pick and have a micro unit. Um, and American Steel, um, PCC Structurals, a Trump board case, reversed specialty health care. American Steel brought it back. Here's some examples. In Nissan, the union sought 87 tool and die employees out of 4,000. Boeing, 175 maintenance out of 7,000. Ikea, 15 maintenance out of 400 plus. So how do you tell employees the rest of the story? Well, for years, we would have meetings, captive audience meetings, right? We are paying you to be here where we are mandating that you go to a meeting where we tell you the rest of the story. General Counsel Abruzzo has said, requiring and forcing employees to go to meetings where they learn about the union um, violates their Section 7 rights. Now, so far, no court has uh, concurred with that, but you know, we've been very cautious in how we deal with these things, and we've had voluntary meetings in union or organizing campaigns. Speaking of messages to workers, the TriCast decision, it's a 1985 decision, and in that case, the board evaluated <clears throat> statements. Um, management told these statements, the, uh, the employees, that it may not be able to work on an informal person-to-person -person basis if they unionized and that the employer would have to run things by the book with a stranger and would not be able to handle personal requests as it had done in the past. The board found that those statements were consistent with the law and lawful. In other words, in a non-union environment, right, we were constantly working with our employees as individuals. In a unionized environment, we have the collective bargaining agreement and your exclusive representative is the union. Well, General Counsel, uh, General Counsel Abruzzo has already indicated she is trying to reverse that decision. For years, you know, the union had a year to work on your employees and you had six weeks to tell the rest of the story. During the Obama administration, they shortened it to as little as 13 days. I've had cases where they petitioned for 13 days and most of the elections were in the you know, 20 to 25 day range. The Trump board went back to a six week election cycle and my most recent campaigns have been four to six weeks. Starting in December of this year, we're going back to the shortened election period. Now, here's what that means. What it means is basically this, think about it. They have a year to convince your workers that a union's a good idea. You find out about the petition. Um, they file it on a Monday, you find out about it on a Tuesday. By the time everybody gets together and comes up with a plan, it's Wednesday. Now we're down to 18 days, right? We've got two weekends in the middle. We're now down to 14 days. You can't have communications with your workers in a group setting within 24 hours of the election. So now we're down to 13 days. Let's assume you have rotating shifts. Then we may be down to six days to communicate with our workers to make up for a year of propaganda. And as a result of ambush elections, unions have been winning more elections. I mentioned Weingarten. The Weingarten decision is a case that says employees have the right to have a coworker present during a, a, an, an investigative interrogation. Now, you don't have to read Weingarten rights. It's not the Miranda rights. You have the right to a lawyer. You have a right to remain silent. But, um, you know, an employee has the right to say, if you're going to ask me questions about my misconduct, I want somebody here. Now, you know, generally those have applied in a unionized setting. We anticipate that the board will go back, as they have during other administrations, and say it also applies in a non-union setting. We've got some cases that are pending, so who knows what will happen. I guess here's the lesson. If you are a non-union employer and one of your workers is invoking their wine garden rights, that probably tells me that you have active organizing going on 
I mean, after all, you know, labor law geeks like myself stay awake at night reading National Labor Relations Board slip opinions. Most workers don't. If they're invoking something that obscure, you've got a much bigger problem than a non-union employer who has an employee asserting wine garden rights. All right. As a result of all of that, you can imagine unfair labor practices are up, their budget has increased, and the number of petitions have gone up. In addition, right, the board recently ordered a Massachusetts cannabis company to recognize and bargain with a union. It's the first under the CMEX decision. Remember, I told you, if they say we represent a majority, you have 14 days to ask for an election. But if during that time period, you commit any unfair labor practices, then they have the right to demand that you bargain with the union and forfeit the right to have a secret ballot election. So in that case, the union presented a letter with signatures of 20 out of 28 employees. They also presented digital copies of signed authorization cards. The union petitioned for an election, which they lost 17 to 11. Ultimately, the administrative law judge found that the company had committed numerous unfair labor practices and that would have warranted setting aside the election and ordered bargaining. All right. So here's the thing. Right. As I mentioned before, if you catch it at card signing, if they never get to 50 percent, then you don't have to worry about CMEX. So the key is to be vigilant. Right. You need to make sure that your supervisors are trained on signs of union organizing. All right, recap. Obviously, the NLRA is a complex law, right? The CMEX decision is a game changer. Um, the board is very aggressive. So now that I've terrified everybody, what are we going to do? Well, Yogi Bear put it this way, right? He said, you got to be very careful if you don't know where you're going because you might not get there. Well, if where you want to be is union free, then here's what you need to do. Number one, given Steri cycle and the things that are going on with policies, you need somebody to re review those. Number two, you need to benchmark wages and benefits, right? Because ultimately the most effective communication is this. If a union's voted in, our only obligation is to meet with the union at reasonable times and places and negotiate in good faith. There is no requirement for management and collective bargaining to agree to any union proposal that doesn't make sense. And management can make counter proposals, even if those proposals offer less in terms of wages and benefits than what you currently have. And of course, you can go in and offer anything that is reasonably supported by data. So if you benchmark your wages and benefits and you're doing better, well, that's certainly something that can be brought up to the workers, right? We're currently paying more than the average if this was a business negotiation, because that's what it is. In a non-union environment, management is constantly balancing, right? The worker's interest with the shareholder's interest. If the employees unionize, then all we care about is the shareholder's interest. We don't pay more for land than we have to. We don't pay more for services than we have to. We don't pay more for raw materials than we have to we're not going to pay more for um, labor than we have to. You need to make sure you take the pulse of your organization. You need to train your folks. You need to know where your strengths and weaknesses are. You need to put together a risk response protocol. And then finally, I recommend you go ahead and have a card signing speech, right? Prepared in advance, taking into account some of your issues. Your policy review should include union free statements, employment at will, your open door, your dispute resolution, your social media policies, your non solicitation, non distribution. You need to make sure that your policies are in compliance with Stericycle and board precedent. Benchmarking, at the end of the day, right, it's a pretty compelling message. We pay more than the average. I just had this with a client. Um, now, one of the things they do is they don't pay overtime at one and a half times regular rate. They pay at one and three quarters times regular rate. So we found out about card signing. 
the CEO gave a presentation to workers. He said, guys, if you want to vote the union in, that's entirely up to you. But I want to under explain collective bargaining. All right. Everything you currently have is up for negotiations. The law requires one and a half times your regular rate of pay under the Fair Labor Standards Act. We pay one and three quarters. All right. I can't tell you what would happen, but I can tell you that's a subject that we're going to negotiate. And we are going to approach it from the perspective of what's the best business decision. Turns out people decided maybe the union wasn't such a good idea after all. All right. We need to know what's going on. I mean, folks, it's pretty simple, right? Unions look for a chink in the armor. The, the AFL-CIO's organizing manual tells organizers to follow the 75-25 rule. Listen 75% of the time and talk 25% of the time because the supervisor talks 75% of the time and only listens 25% of the time. That's how they take the loyalty from the person who pays the worker to the person the worker has to pay. Think about it from this perspective. We've got a 50% divorce rate in the United States of America. How does it happen? Well, under the traditional model, boy meets girl, they fall in love. Boy saves up for a ring, boy asks for a dad. Uh, asks the dad for permission to marry. Dad pays for a wedding, they go on a honeymoon, they get their first apartment. After work, they walk through the neighborhood near their apartment, they look at the kind of house they wanna have, they talk about their day, they talk about their hopes and dreams, they talk about their future, and then you fast forward five, six, seven, ten years. They buy their first house and they get promotions at work and they have children and the roof is leaking and the transmission needs to be repaired and the child is sick. And then what happens? Do they come home at work every night at five o'clock and go for a walk holding hands, talking about their day and their dreams? No, frequently it goes like this. Do we really have to talk about this now? Can't you solve this yourself? I solved the last problem. And then what happens? Well, girl meets other boy. And other boy says things like, I can't believe he doesn't listen to you. I wish I could meet somebody like you. He certainly doesn't appreciate you. How about let's go to lunch? Why don't we talk about what's been going on at work? Let's talk about your dreams for the future. And then girls falls in love with other boy. It's the same psychology. You have to listen to your employees and you have to respond to your employees. If you don't, somebody else will, right? So you have to have regular meetings. You have to have open doors. You have to cultivate leaders. You have to figure out where your strengths and weaknesses are. You have to figure out who your supervisors are and who aren't. You have to conduct surveys, perceptions, audits, and you need to make sure you've got a pretty good idea where you fit in your market for talent as well as your industry for talent. You have to train your supervisors. We have to keep it simple. You have to go through the tips rule and the faux rule. For those of you who don't know what that is, it's the do's and do nots. Do not tips. You cannot threaten, you cannot interrogate, you cannot promise, and you cannot spy, right? Tips, T-I-P-S, threaten, interrogate, promise, or spy. But you can talk about your foe. You can share facts, opinions, and examples or experiences. All of your supervisors should be fluent in the tips and foe rule. They should also be fluent in signs of organizing, signs of discontent, and they should know the basics of what a union authorization card is. It is a legal document where a worker signs away at least part of their rights. You need to have a plan, right? It's not a matter of whether there's union organizing on the increase. It's when, where, and who. And if you happen to be the who in the future, you really need to have a plan, right? All right, what are we doing if there are no issues or activities? Well, if there are no issues or activities, we take precautionary measures. We make sure we've got good working relationships, right? If we are being targeted, well, we need to make sure we have a plan. We need to be aggressive if there's some degree of organizing going on. And we better have a plan of action if all of a sudden we get a demand for recognition um, or if we know there's card signing going on. At a bare minimum, you should have 
at least a card signing letter, a card signing speech, some basic handouts on card signing, whatever union might be targeting you, questions and answers for the supervisors, as well as other information. Like, when are we going to talk to our employees? Where are we going to talk to our employees? How are we going to continue production while we have these meetings, right? I mean, here's the thing. I think we're all going in the wrong direction when it comes down to the National Labor Relations Act, but what are we going to do? Well, folks, in 30 years of doing this, here's what I found. Most of the issues that I deal with, whether it's a union organizing campaign, a class action lawsuit, a visit from Uncle Sam or Aunt Georgia, as the case may be, it's usually a function of poor leadership, poor communication, or a combination thereof. In our last few minutes together, let's talk a little bit about leadership. You know, one company identified seven leaders you can't afford. You don't need these people within your organization, right? They will lead to issues, unionization or litigation. Number one, I'm the boss, don't you forget it. If somebody's the boss, everybody knows that, right? A supervisor throwing around his or her weight does nothing but breed resentment. Servant leadership, leadership by example, is the only model that works. As President Reagan once said, I don't care who gets the credit as long as the work gets done. That should be the mantra for every one of your first line supervisors. You, you can't bully them into compliance. That may have worked once upon a time. It doesn't work now. The 20 somethings of today, they're not intimidated by their parents or their teachers or their professors. They're not intimidated by you. They don't care what your job title is. They don't even care if you can fire them because it turns out it's a buyer's market for talent, but they're very good at looking up their rights and asserting them. You need your first line supervisors to understand they are the company, the company is them. They don't need to blame corporate. Once they're a supervisor, they are corporate. They can't badmouth company policies to their subordinates because if they do, one day somebody will make them do their job. And then once they have to do their job, their employees will call them a hypocrite, a liar, and a fraud. And once that happens, they lose credibility. And when you lose credibility, you lose influence. And it turns out the definition of leadership is the ability to influence others. Same thing with being inconsistent. You can't play favorites. You have to hold your superstars and your super slackers to identical standards. Just because somebody's not well educated doesn't mean they're not smart. I meet lots of people who do not have a lot of education, but they have a lot of intelligence and a lot of common sense. Those people are usually the first ones to see through a lie. You can't dog cuss people into compliance. One subject, one verb, no profanity. The only thing in life that's more contagious than enthusiasm is negativity. Your supervisors have got to be the biggest cheerleaders for the company. I've seen campaigns that were lost because the supervisors were every bit as negative about the company as the workers. And not only were they not sympathetic to senior leadership, they were undermining senior leadership. So not only do you need to take the pulse of your workers, you need to take the pulse of your first line supervisors and find out, are they for you or are they against you? And finally, senior leaders, let me just say this. Leadership is about getting your rear end out of the chair and going and walking the floor. Right? Leadership's about relationships. If the first time they ever see you is when there's a problem, you have zero credibility. If they see you out there all the time and you know who they're married to and you know who their kids are and you ask about what's going on and you ask them what's, you know, how, how things can be improved and they genuinely know that you care about them, well, it turns out they'll, you'll have some credibility somewhere down the road. And you probably won't have the issues that lead to unionization. All right. One final concept, and that's this. Not too long ago, Gallup poll called people at home and they said, do you identify as a supervisor? Do you identify as a worker? And then they gave people 10 categories and they said, we want you to rank these in order. Working, working conditions, wages, sympathy with personal problems, appreciation, feeling in on things, working conditions, company loyalty, 
promotion and job growth, job security, and discipline. Here were the remarkable findings. Here's what your supervisors said were most important. 700 supervisors. They said, number one, wages. Number two, job security. Number three, promotion and growth. Number four, working conditions. And then they asked workers. And here's what the workers said. 34,000 employees. They said, number one, appreciation. Number two, feeling in on things. Number three, sympathy with personal problems. Number four, job security. There was only one overlap between what workers thought was important and what supervisors thought was important. No wonder there's plenty for Jonathan Martin to do. Guys, that's why it's important to walk the floor because when I work with companies, particularly foreign companies, the first things that I encourage senior leaders to learn in English, thank you, followed by I'm sorry, right? They need to be present on the floor and they need to thank people. Why? Because your employees want appreciation. They want to know what's going on. Transparency is not just a buzzword. Transparency is a way that successful businesses remain successful. Folks, if you don't tell them what's going on, they're going to guess. And whatever they conjure up is going to endure to your detriment, not to your benefit. They want somebody to know that, hey, there's more than what's going on in this company and we'll work with you. See, it's the soft skills that make business profitable, not the hard skills. But typically when we promote somebody, we get them focused on nothing but economics, 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 which is why it's ingrained in supervisors. All right. So how do you do it? Number one, let them know they have value. And believe it or not, employees want to hear that regularly and from, uh, from lots of people, right? Say three positive things for every negative thing. Say thank you. Two most powerful words in the English language. Publicly recognize high achievers. In their book, The One Minute Manager, Dr. Spencer John Johnson and Dr. Ken Blanchard said, if you want your job to be easy, catch somebody doing something right. It sends the same message, I'm paying attention, but it encourages excellence. Be visible. Senior leaders need to be on the floor, right? Workers want that, and particularly the current generation. You need to have regular meetings where you tell people what's going on. Involve them in goal setting. Many of you have read, like I have, how to win friends and influence people. And in that book, what does Dale Carnegie say? If you want somebody to do something, make them think it's their idea. It's even better if it actually is their idea. General Patton once said, don't tell a man what to do. Tell a man what needs to be done, and he'll surprise you with his ingenuity. Offer transparency. Let people know what's going on. Make sure we have people in the right job. It's funny, over the last three years, I've heard this. We can't find workers, we can't find workers, we can't find workers. Turns out if you don't lose a worker, you don't have to find a worker. Maybe you have the right person in the wrong job, right? Before we let people go, let's figure out if maybe it is the right person in the wrong job. Let them know how they're making a difference. The 20 somethings of today, they want to make a difference. It's important to them, much more important than money. And finally, you need to give them a path forward. Now with that, as lawyers are prone to do, I have used up all my time, although I'll stick around for a question or two. Y'all have probably figured out I'm not a rocket scientist by any stretch of the imagination, but it turns out this guy was. And Einstein said the definition of insanity is doing the same thing over and over again and expecting different results. In the last <clears throat> 55 minutes, I've told you stories about People who've gotten in trouble. If you repeat those behaviors, you'll repeat those outcomes. We've also talked a little bit about positive employee relations, servant leadership, and I can give you example after example of companies that have outperformed their competitors because they embrace those values. Who says so? The London School of Economics. They recently followed the 100 best employers in the United States to work for. They looked at 28 years worth of data Shareholder value was their measurement tool. And what they said was this, companies where workers say, this is a great place to work, outperform their competitors from 2.3 to 3.8% annually. Again, right, if you repeat those behaviors, you'll repeat those outcomes. 
one final thing, and that's this. It comes down to the attitude that your supervisors and your leaders have. Chuck Swindoll put it this way. The longer I live, the more I realize the impact of attitude on life. Attitude to me is more important than the past, than education, than money, than circumstances, than failures, than what other people think or say or do. It's more important than appearance, giftedness, or skill. It will make or break an organization, a school, a home. Let's insert your company. The remarkable thing is we have a choice every day regarding the attitude that we will embrace for that day. Can't change the past. We can't change the fact that people will act in a certain way. We can't change the inevitable. The only thing we can do is play the one string we have, and that is our attitude. I'm convinced that life is 10% what happens to me and 90% how I react to it, and so it is with you. Likewise, things are going to go wrong at work. If it was fun, they wouldn't call it work. But we need to have a plan, and we need to know how to react when there are issues. And if we do so properly, then our discussion today is purely academic. With that, here's the SHRM code for those of you who are seeking credit, and the HRCI code for those of you who are seeking credit. I apologize that we had a few technical glitches that got us started about five minutes late. Any of y'all who uh, have any questions or want anything, here's how you get a hold of me. Um, that's my direct dial telephone number. That's my email. My grandmother used to always say, Jonathan, I can always make more money. I can't make more time. Don't waste my time. So since you were kind enough to give me an hour of your time today, I want it to be worth your while. So if you have any follow-up, please don't hesitate to reach out.